while since I put together an awesome budget gaming PC build. Which is why in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to build this, the best $850 gaming PC you can build right now. I'm going to be walking through all the parts that make it possible, how to assemble this system step by step, and looking at performance in a little bit more detail later on. Let's do this. <laughs> Asus's latest cashback program now allows you to save up to £110 with the purchase of selected Asus AMD Radeon GPUs. Simply buy any eligible graphics card before the end of March from a participating retailer, link down below, to score yourself some cashback. Plus, if you review your card via Asus Rate My Gear, you can maximise that cashback for the best savings. Learn more at the first links in the description below. I'm going to be using Newegg to pick the parts out for this build, not because they've sponsored the video, but because it gives us a good idea of up-to-date pricing. Plus, if you're willing to shop around, you can potentially save even more money on our $850 budget. Now, the first place that I'm going to start is the CPU. I know roughly what our options are at this price point, so it's an easy part to tick off now as we start to chip away at the available budget. Those options include something like the AMD Ryzen 5 5600X. That's probably on the lower end of where we want to go, and you can see here that comes in at about $157. On the Intel side we've got the 12400F. Now the 12400F is actually coming in cheaper, 154 on the list, but $14 off with the promo code. It is worth noting as well, Newegg automatically applies the promo codes, so it isn't like you've got to do any work in order to save that extra cash. Now with this in the cart, we can now go ahead and pick up a motherboard, because we know what socket and chipset we need. We'll be looking at the B660, or preferably B760 chipsets for this system. In terms of B760, our cheapest options coming in from ASRock at $89, MSI have also got one in this sort of price range, but this Gigabyte board looks particularly appealing. This is 99 for their DS3H. They also do a Wi-Fi version for an extra $20, or you can pick up a budget Wi-Fi adapter. The choice is totally yours. And to be honest with you, I think this is going to work really nicely. Take a look at the I.O. You can see why I like it. You've got that USB-C connector, you've got Ethernet, and of course, if you spend a bit more on the Wi-Fi board, which I'll link alongside everything in the description below, you haven't really got too many issues getting going. Crucially, for a budget build like this, this board is also DDR4, that's going to save us a lot of money on the memory, and while I'd rather build a DDR5 system, there just isn't a great deal of performance upside for a super budget build. Talking of DDR4 memory, 16 gigs is where we could go, let's just see where that brings us out, but I'd rather have 32 gigabytes. Looking at our available options, you can see this 3600 megahertz kit for 95 with the promo code, that's about $20, $25 cheaper than DDR5. If we work down the lineup, if you drop to 16 gigs, you can do this for 50 four dollars but i really don't want to trim that much memory out instead team groups t4 delta is what i'm going to go for and at 32 gigs of capacity i think that's going to work well and for the price this is perfect you can get it in black or white depending on the kind of color scheme you're going for so i'm pretty happy with that and we haven't got to change out that cheap motherboard either next up is storage now there's a drive that i like to recommend in my budget builds from crucial their p3 plus you can see you can get a one terabyte one for 69 dollars or a 500 gigabyte one for 49 dollars now Again, with this being a super budget oriented build, I'm going to factor in the $500 drive on the basis of saving money and maximizing gaming performance. Ultimately, building at this price point does mean compromises. Would I rather recommend a terabyte? Absolutely. But every dollar, every cent counts when we're trying to keep a lid on costs as we are in this build. Talking of which, my next component choice could be a little bit of a controversial one. And that's because I am actually going to opt for an air cooler in this system rather than sticking with the included free stock cooler you get on the 12. 400F. The stock cooler is simply too loud, too noisy, and too hot for my liking, and it's not something I feel totally confident recommending. Deepcool's AK400 or the Vetro V5 in black are both really good options. The Vetro comes in at $28, but the Deepcool one is $35, but there's a $5 discount code. Personally, the AK400 is a more well-rounded, slightly better performing cooler, and for that reason, I'm going to opt to spend the extra $2 and put that in the cart as well. You might notice I've not added the GPU in yet. That's because we still need to get the case 
case and the PSU sorted first. Now, to be honest with you, on the case front, I'm really not kind of sure where we want to go for this price point. So instead, I'm just going to search PC cases, sort by best selling, and then set the maximum budget to around about $75. Roughly, the case should make up no more than 10% of your overall build budget. Instantly, one that strikes out to me is this Corsair 3000D. Now, I've seen this floating about a lot. When it first came out, it was way too expensive. But now, $75 plus there's a $15 promo code brings it in at $60. That's got to be one of Corsair's cheapest cases in forever. Now, they do do an RGB version, I believe, which is going to give you extra fans as well. That's 100 with 25 So $75 for the RGB versus $60 for the non-RGB. If you've already got RGB fans, don't bother. Just pop those in instead. But if someone is building this as their first system and hasn't got any other parts, then I think for $75, ignore the overall list price. $75 is a pretty good deal. Power-wise, I know we'll need about 650 watts of this build as well. Let's have a look once again at some of the best selling options and see which ones cut the mustard as far as cost goes. Now, instantly, loads of these are way too expensive. You guys are spending absolute coin on power supplies. I don't want to spend any more than $90. Still needs to be decent, but I want to keep in a good budget. Corsair CX650M coming in at 80. Thermal Take Tough Power, 79. MSI A650G out, 89. So by the looks of things, Corsair once again, and this is kind of unusual. Corsair are normally a little bit more at the premium end, kind of coming in as a great value choice. Semi-modular, so you get your motherboard and CPU cable pre-ran. Everything else plugs in at your own will, and you can see all those modular connectors there. Fair play, Corsair. It's going straight in my basket. Now then, where are we at budget-wise? We have spent just a shave under $600. Let's just check in the cart. We've got everything. We've got the case. We've got the motherboard. We've got the power supply, CPU, RAM, CPU cooler, SSD. I think we're good to go. And you can see with all of our promo codes, combo savings, we're down to $550. So $300 to spend on a GPU to get to our $800 to $850 budget. Now, as far as graphics card goes, we've got a few different options at this price point. Now, this is an area of the market that's particularly complicated. That's because on the AMD side, you've got the 8 and 16 gig models of the RX 7600. The 8 gig one's pretty good, a bit VRAM constrained, but great value. While on the Nvidia side, you've got the 4060 and the 3060 from last generation. The 4060s had really terrible reviews. Now you can see here, 3060s coming in at about 289. And for lots of people, the 12 gigs of video memory will be quite appealing. But I'm going to be quite controversial. And I'm going to say, don't buy that. I genuinely think the RX 7600 is a better buy instead. And let me explain why. You can see this Gigabyte WinForce card comes in at 269. So it's cheaper than the 3060. It has got less video memory and the bandwidth on the memory is smaller. But the rasterization performance is better. Take a look at these graphs in Apex Legends for example, Hogwarts Legacy and F1 2022, where in every title, the 7600 pulls a discernible lead. Now, yes, the lack of video memory is a bit disappointing and it is a bit frustrating, but it's important to bear in mind, this is a 1080p gaming PC. It's not intended for 1440p gaming. Not that the 7600 can't do 1440p gaming, but I think getting too wound up over video memory for playing at high resolutions on a budget build just isn't the hill I think we need to die on. Now, let's see where with all our discount codes that brings us in 820 so we're under that 850 dollar budget just enough money left for a totally legit copy of windows and any tools that you might need but i'll stop yapping order these parts and rejoin you once they've all arrived a few days have passed pretty much everything has arrived i only made one change after watching the first half of the video back and swapped out the cx 650m for the cx 650 this saves us ten dollars we lose the modularity but for a budget build like this i really don't believe it matters i'll link this and all the other options mentioned today down in the description below. Now, what better place to start really than with the motherboard? And specifically, by installing everything into the motherboard we possibly can at this stage. That includes our CPU, RAM, and of course the SSD. Now this is Gigabyte's B760M DS3H. Of course, Intel has its disadvantages in that we're kind of at the end of that LGA1700 platform right now. AMD motherboards, by comparison, are obviously gonna have more upgradability into the future. However, that isn't to say you can't upgrade this build at a later date. This board still supports right up to a 14900K. Not that you probably want to put one in, but an easy upgrade to an i5 or even a lower end i7 is going to be totally fine later on. For now, though, let's install our 12400F, one of the best value CPUs on the market right now. That easily installs into the socket 
it, just get all those golden triangles lined up in the bottom left. Pop the socket cover down. Keep hold of this black plastic as you may need it in future if you sell or RMA the board and pop the arm down like so. For the next part on the list, I'll be using the gray dim slots in this build for our Team Group T-Force Delta. Again, really, really easy to install this. Get it lined up, bit of pressure on both sides. And for this particular build, you've got the T-Force logo on the top of the RAM dim at the top. Of course, it's two spare dims for another 32 gigs later, meaning you can still have up to 64 gigs of memory in this build. Now for the next stage of the system, you'll want to get rid of your standard Phillips head and instead pick up a small teeny tiny screwdriver and go ahead and unscrew this M.2 heatsink at the top, just above our main PCI lane. This is gonna help keep the M.2 drive nice and cool, which is great, and it makes the whole build look that little bit cleaner. Gigabyte's DS3H lineup, are there more bare bones motherboard? But even still, it's nice to see small aesthetic and practical features like this come into play. Slide the drive in, the crucial text is gonna be upside down. That seems to be a thing with Gigabyte boards. They install the M.2s the other way round, oddly enough, and then just fasten that heatsink back down. That's gonna screw into the standoff and secure both the heatsink and the M.2 drive into place. Now there is one more thing I'm gonna do at this stage, and that's do some of the prep for the CPU cooler. Taking a look at the rear of the motherboard, and you'll see we've got Intel's sort of built-in metal protection backplate. We'll be using these holes for a slightly wider backplate in this instance. This backplate comes included with our AK400 and simply slots through the rear of the motherboard. You then need to follow this up with these black plastic stoppers, which are gonna go onto each one, the threads now poking through the rear of the motherboard, before finally adding this black plastic cooler bracket into place on top. Screw this down, one in each corner. Again, these screws come included with the AK400. Don't forget to add on a dab of thermal paste, nice and easily, a little something like so, before finally dropping the actual cooler on top. Get these screws lined up over each post and then just tighten these first by hand but then with the screwdriver to get it nice and secure. I'm going to add the fan on afterwards as there's no need to bulk things up and get things in the way at this stage. That brings me on quite nicely to the case. Now I'm actually quite excited about this Corsair's 3000D Airflow. Now this is quite a cool little proposition. It's basically a mini 4000D but cheaper. You get a nice tempered glass side panel with build quality that feels resoundingly good. In fact this feels very very similar size wise to the 4000 series, you do lose out on a few things. For example, that IO, you've only got two USB 3 type A's, no type C, that's a bit disappointing. And of course, if you don't go for the RGB version, you're restricted to more simple non-RGB fans. I'm gonna add in some of Deepcool's RGB fans at the end, as that's still gonna work out cheaper in this instance than getting the RGB version of the case. I can keep these basic non-RGB fans at the back and at the top, just to give us that better airflow. Now, as you can see, it is a mid-tower ATX case, so there is room in here for standard ATX boards. However, I'm gonna pop this MATX design in and I don't think it's gonna to look too silly. Primarily because this is such a compact ATX case, there shouldn't be too much dead space. Check all your standoffs are in the right place. In this board and case combo, I think they're not quite gonna be there. We're gonna to need to add one in here and one in down here. I'll circle those so you can see exactly where, change those first using the included standoff tool and then add the motherboard into place. There is an IO shield on this board that needs clicking in, so make sure you do that as well. Not a step you particularly want to forget. Round things off by adding the CPU cooler fan back in and we're good to go. At this stage of the build, it can be tempting to go ahead and put the power supply and the graphics card in, but we're not gonna do that. Stop, wait there. We're gonna do some cables and wiring, specifically the front panel cables. This is really easy if done now. We've got a USB 3 header, that goes to the right hand side of the motherboard board, our HD audio for our headphone mic jack, which goes to the bottom left, and we've also got our JFP1 front panel cables, which go to the bottom right. These can be fiddly, so check out the pin diagram on your screen now for a bit of help in getting these along. Once we've done those, then it makes sense to put the power supply in and get all of that wiring done as well. Once those are in, it's power supply time. This is Corsair's small, but standard ATX CX650. Now, as I say, Corsair, good to see them getting a bit more price competitive. I was actually shocked when I looked on Newegg at the best selling power supplies with how many were Corsair. Really, really good to see. And obviously very reputable units. This one's 80 plus bronze certified. Now, you can see here at the rear of the case, we've got plenty of room to actually pop the PSU in. You can go fan up or fan down in this case. I'm gonna go fan at the bottom as that's gonna pull in fresh air from under the chassis. Just beware that if you plan on putting this on a thick rug or really thick carpet, this might not be a great idea. This case has got more clearance than the average chassis, so you should be okay. Get that screwed in with four screws. Then it's simply a case of wiring up all the power cables. The first of those is the motherboard. That's gonna go to the right-hand side. It's the biggest power cable in the bunch, so you really can't miss it. That's closely followed up by the 
CPU power cable, which is going to come up here to the top left hand corner. And the only power cable after that is the GPU power connection. But we need a graphics card first, and that's where our 7600 comes in. As I say, a slightly controversial GPU by modern standards. The graphics card market nowadays feels so ferociously heated with AMD and Nvidia in really close competition. And obviously, Intel also joining the party and getting a lot better, by the way, with that Arc GPUs. For now, though, let's focus on the, well, the here and now, really, and install the 7600. Now, by the looks of things, it's going to go in our top two PCI slots just here. So go ahead and remove those, take those out, push the retention clip back on the motherboard and slide the GPU into place. There we are, bit of pressure, and then those same screws will stop it from basically doing that and keep it nice and secure and nice and steady. So a few rotations for both of those screws and we should be good to go. All that's left then is to wire up our single eight pin power connector, the extra six plus two pin can cable tie out the way. We don't need that for this system. All that remains is to add some RGB fans in the front of the case and remove this 120 mil fan, put that at the top as I say for a bit better exhaust. And that really is all there is to it. A really sleek looking simple build. And once that's in, all that remains to do is boot this thing up and see how it performs. It's all good. It looking nice, but do those frame rate metrics stack up? The short answer is yes, especially for the price point. The first example of that is in Hogwarts Legacy. At 1080p high settings, the build pulls in 120 FPS on average. While it's true this card is a bit VRAM constrained, especially at 1440p, you can see here in Hogwarts at 1080p, it's proving to be no bother. At 1080p competitive settings in Fortnite, that's everything down to low except the render distance, which is set to far, again, the build does well. 249 FPS on average was mightily impressive. And of course, ensures you're going to be able to get that competitive gaming experience. Apex Legends at 1080p high settings this time is a similar story. Here the build pulled in 194 FPS on average, again really really great to see and providing a fantastic gaming experience. F1 2023, one of my personal favourite titles at 1080p high settings, delivered 123 FPS on average, yet another good result. While enabling FSR 3 in our next game, Call of Duty's Warzone at 1080p high, further delivered impressive results. We're looking at 270 FPS. Now, obviously, FSR 3 with its fancy frame gen technology certainly helping the frame rate along here. We saw this again in Modern Warfare 3, where the frame rate's been artificially boosted in many respects, up to 313 FPS this time in Modern Warfare 3. But either way, whether you've got FSR 3 or FSR 2 enabled or totally disabled, you can see this as a build that for a budget price point really delivers strong results. I'm a big fan of the 7600 when it's at the right price, and I think this 800 $50 build makes mega sense. A lot of people nowadays tell me that value PCs are dead. Not so fast. What do you guys think of this build? Let me know in the comments down below. Get subscribed, see more from me. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.